welcome to 2020, man. It's, yeah, uh, it's a new brand, year. So brand every, new decade, depending on who you talk to. Yeah, yeah. I have some goals that I'm probably not going to achieve, but, um, you know, I think that's kind of how New Year's goes. Yeah. You maybe have a couple of goals, and it's good just to kind of get off to the start of the new year and do a couple of the goals and hopefully not forget about them too much throughout the year. But um, Yeah, I, I just kind of feel like people kind of get excited around the New Year's and they want to, like, put some effort and energy into something. I know I get, like, a lot more interest from second shooters this time of year. They all tend to email me more and they're mm -hmm. ready to get out and try new things and do new things and start start progressing their photography as a business or as a as a livelihood, you know? And I definitely feel like for myself the same kind of thing. Like I always try to give myself a goal or two over the course of the year that I'm trying to do something that's different than what I would normally do. Maybe not a resolution per se, but like you know, like you're saying, like something to to try to achieve over the course of the year. Yeah, I always feel like New Year's resolutions are kind of kind of weird, just because you should be trying to improve yourself throughout the year. So like, I've, I haven't been too big on New Year's resolutions uh, for for a lot of years, but um, you know, as I like, kind of get older, I'm kind of like, okay, like I'm I'm less sort of um, skeptical of it. I'm like, okay, like it's it's good. So I'm starting to maybe come around to them a little bit more. But yeah, I, I feel like yeah. as I've gotten older, I've been more like I've been trying to make them more about trying to do something that I haven't done that I've been meaning to do or something that yeah. I've been trying to get around to that I haven't gotten to so far in life. <laughs> and then that kind of helps me achieve the things that I want in a bucket list without letting another year slip by, you know, because it's easy to let a year go by and then you didn't achieve the things you wanted to do or you didn't, you know what I mean? So it's good to kind of have goals and be like, all right, in 2020, I'm going to make a new YouTube channel or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to try this new photography style I've never done or I'm going to be getting proficient at street shooting or something, yeah. you know, like, I feel like that's a good goal to try and get yourself out of your comfort zone a little. For shake sure. Shake it up a little. Yeah, this year I've been thinking about how I want to shoot 100,000 photos. And I, I started thinking about this a lot, like way yeah. before like New Year's, but I want to shoot 100,000 photos, um, you know, not at weddings basically. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, dude, that's easy. We're going to shoot 100,000 <laughs> no, photos. No, no, no problem. <laughs> try to find stuff to make photos of. Yeah, uh, outside of weddings. That would, be, yeah. that would be interesting. Yeah, so I'm at 1,000 right now. So I've spent Whoa, about. so you got a ways to. Oh, you got a ways in a, in a Yeah, day. yeah, I've spent about two weeks and I got about 1,000 photos. And so if you're going out and you don't have, and they're not portraits or anything, uh, then right, it's, you're, just trying, you're, you're trying to think stuff. more and you're not trying to shoot crap, then it's like, um, mm -hmm. you know, if I make 100,000 photos and then 0.05% of those are like amazing photos, you know, and I'm actually trying to shoot 100,000, I'm not just pointing everywhere and shooting like crazy and stuff, right. then, um, you know, the 0.05% are where it's at. Alex Webb always says that it's like the 0.01%, but I don't know. I think with digital photography, maybe it could be the 0.05%. I mean, I always feel like that too. I always <clears> feel like there's just some pictures in every session or everything that I do that are just a lot better than all the rest. Yeah, there's some photos that just line up perfectly and it, it wasn't necessarily you all the time, but it was like the circumstances that lined up with the light, with the people, with the expression, yeah. and everything just clicks every once in a while. And now with the new cameras, like that, with the mirrorless, like you know kind of when you're in that zone because you're seeing it kind of happen on the camera. So like mm -hmm. I find that I've got that 0.1% that, that has gotten maybe that period of time I know I'm like in the nice light and I'm hitting great shots. So I might shoot yeah. more there than I might have otherwise. Yeah, that, that's one thing I miss about DSLRs is it was more mysterious because I didn't know <laughs> if I was getting it or not. Uh, but I, that's, how, not, yeah, but... that's how film shooters thought when they switched over to right, DSLRs. Right, I mean, it's something new, you always lose something that you have. Yeah. Yeah, so I feel like that's a thing. And I feel like a lot of uh, new photographers are always coming to me. Um, either they want a second shoot for me or I get a lot of uh, photographers who are interested in interning and just learning new stuff. And so I always, I always like that part of the energy of the New Year's. I feel like that. Uh, oftentimes having young blood come into the into the world with you and being interested in, in what you do in photography and stuff can help as an older photographer get your gears spinning yeah. again, get you like like uh, focused on, on maybe a different angle. Yeah, or I'm going new. on uh, 47, so I'm starting to get up there in age. And so, yeah, 47. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, I'm starting to get a little bit old. Um, but I don't think you're yeah, really do that you, old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But... Um, well, if you say you're you're older than you are, then I think um, like the internet will think that I look really good. For, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Dude, yeah. You look so, great for four Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I found that like uh, finding some like photographers um, who are just starting out, who are like like young and excited and stuff, it does kind of motivate you. Like it makes yeah, you, yeah, yeah, brings yeah. like a bit of enthusiasm to everything. Yeah, for sure. Everything uh, when you're starting out is cool and new and exciting and. Right. 
Yeah, so I think... And once you've been doing it for season after season after mm -hmm. season, and you've done a lot of these New Year's resolutions, and you've set a lot of goals, and you've tried a bunch of new things, it can, a year after year, you can get stagnant. And you're like, all right, well, I've already tried a whole lot of things. What else do I do? So yeah. sometimes just the, the new person coming in can really <laughs> kind of set things off, you know? Yeah, um, being 53, I sometimes find that... <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, is there um, anything else that kind of motivates you in photography? That motivates me? Well, so like right now, like I was saying, I'm, I'm trying to, to be more goal driven. So like it's, I'm really mm -hmm. interested in, in creating, uh, we're working on some new content for our YouTube channel and it's mm -hmm. really cool that we're, we're uh, actually building a whole other series that we're going to do run alongside this about photography equipment. So I'm really stoked to do stuff like that. So that's more like a business kind of goal. But then I'm also still trying to make creative goals. Like there's shots that I still have in my head that I've been trying to make for years that I haven't pulled off. And so I still have that list that I'm always trying to make. So every year I'm like trying to knock off a couple off of that list. Yeah. Nice. Stuff like that. Uh, yeah. How about you? Do you have... Uh, yeah, I was waiting for you to ask. Um, <laughs> any more kind of creativity so. stuff that you're going to be bringing to your... Yeah, 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 hundred percent. So I was reading uh, some an, a Joseph Kol Koldinka interview. I don't know. I'm probably just hundred percent bu uh, butchering that name. And uh, I don't know who that fellow is, so um, I can't help you, man. Yeah, he's uh, he's a really amazing photographer. Two books. Um, he did uh, Gypsies in nineteen in the nineteen sixties, I believe. He oh, went, so it's way back. Yeah, yeah. Like he film went, days. Yeah, he uh, old went, film days. Yeah, yeah. He. Uh, Quit his engineering job at 30, and then um, That's what I did. <laughs> yeah, and then traveled Europe and um, just uh, lived with gypsies. Uh, and I did not like live a with monk gypsies. had no possessions. I mean, that sounds like a great way to get in with a group of people. Like if you were gonna try to create the best Photo work project. you could. Yeah, so it's really beautiful. So at this time, he did uh, everything with like a, I think it was a 25 millimeter lens, and nobody was shooting wide angle on street. Henry Cartier Bresant was, of course, shooting like yeah, 50, 50, sometimes yeah. 35. There's and so, a new um, kind of perspective. Yeah, yeah. So at 25, um, I think that they're really creative. You have to get really close, and um, it kind of separates him from a lot of other photographers. And then, um, I, and then he shot um, for I think it was like a 10 or 12 year span. He shot the project Exiles, which is his other famous work, mm -hmm. and um, I think that's one of the best photography works I've ever seen in like top three for sure hmm. um what's it about um he was exiled from his home country and he couldn't go oh, back so he went home and yeah and it I was like photos that inspired yeah he's or? from i can't remember exactly was where like he's from or just um, like everything? no no it's like people and it's done in this weird creative way where it seems like he uh took a lot of pictures and then uh found this feel, the, the feeling that he had of being exiled from his country and expressed those through these random situations oh, that he found. And he did it all around Europe and he spent, you know, I think 10 years, um, you know, traveling around so Europe. So, like, he after brought Jesus. his perspective back <clears throat> and then he saw people who are maybe in a position that were similar to how yeah. he felt in his mind and yeah. tried to photograph them yeah, to there's this, emote his own feeling. Yeah, feeling of being like exiled from his homeland. So that sounds that really interesting. Cool. Yeah, and yeah. That, that would be really personal. Like if you got to yeah. your homeland. <laughs> yeah, for sure. He was probably angry and yeah, felt, angry, uh, and, but still about. like, like you still have that feeling of like nostalgia, so angry and nostalgia. Yeah, yeah. But um, I was reading about this Exiles project, and uh, he shot around a thousand rolls of film a year, which is thirty six thousand images. And I'm like, I'm shooting digital. Like, why am I not shooting a hundred thousand photos a year? Like, this is this is silly. Like, I want to um, do this. I want to do that. I think about doing it, but I'm not actually doing it. This guy is somebody who did it. He did a thousand rolls of film a year, which is just insane. So, you know, yeah, I mean, and then costly, you know, if you're traveling costly. all over mm -hmm. Europe and uh, you're kind of, I, I assume he didn't have that much money. I mean, he didn't really have, uh, well, he was living with gypsies. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I don't know that my New Year's resolution is to get that. To shoot a thousand, yeah, I don't know that I want to go like join up with the gypsies and get that ingrained yeah. in something. But like, I do like to have realistic goals that I feel like I can actually achieve. Like, if I set my goals for the New Year's too high, uh, the, they they might never get achieved. You know, so mm -hmm. I try to do things that I'm already working on, and things that I want to see come to fruition. Like, mm -hmm. I really want to see the the you know the, the side channel project work. So I'm gonna yeah. put a lot of effort and time into that. And then I know that that will probably come to fruition. It's, it's yeah. a, it tends to be the things that you focus the most time and effort and energy on are the things that work out the best. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I guess I'm trying to become the other resolution I have uh, just to you know keep the conversation going. I was like, I don't know where to go go with that. Um, but um, the thing that I'm working on, I guess, is to become more of a um, of a struggling artist. So I've realized that. Uh, 
I, I don't want to have all these possessions. When I had all the possessions, I went through existential crises and was like, oh my God, like this isn't making me happy and stuff. So I guess like uh, I've kind of realized that like, you know, I'm just kind of going further down that road of becoming a broke artist and stuff. So I think, you know, goals can be financial. They can be, I think you got to kind of like analyze your year, analyze like the previous years and stuff and be like, like, where was I at when I was spending $15,000 a year on gear, when I was buying a new car? Was I like really, really stoked and all that? Was that actually making me like happy? And I was like, no, I was going through an existential crisis and I was like, just buying a bunch of crap, you know? And I was like, and then when I was buying all the crap, I was like, oh, this wasn't really making me happy. So I don't know. So I guess like, you know, it's also good to kind of like analyze that, but I don't know. I'm kind of going off topic here, but yeah. So you're kind of hoping in 2020 you'll be more broke? Uh, Is that what you're saying? Oh, I'm hoping to live more broke. Oh, yeah. you live more broke. Well, live, like, live more in so poverty. like yeah. what would be also interesting is like, since you know that you can make so much money with photography mm. to like, uh, with wedding photography, I should say, is like maybe trying to apply your skills to a different genre of photography where mm. you won't make as much money because then yeah. you would have to struggle yeah you'd yeah, have to try sure. harder and you have to figure more things out like i always feel like yeah. we're, the struggle is where you learn the most yeah it's yeah I am. I'm, I'm hitting my, my head on a on, on walls like every day i'm like going out and you know taking a light rail downtown and shooting pictures and like trying to find the right light that, I, that i'm like waiting on pictures and all this all this craziness but and sometimes yeah. that struggle is the best part like because yeah. like and you might have months like where you're just trying it over and over again and like things <laughs> yeah. aren't working out and you're just like, but as long as you're willing to just keep trying and keep pushing forward, then like you just break through a wall and then you have like a period where lots of fruition, lots yeah. of things come to be that you're just like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's get back on. Can't onto, really uh, appreciate the the sweet without the sour. Oh, for sure. Yeah, let's get back on wedding photography. So, do you do you have wedding photography goals like currently right now? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have the same goal every year to book at least 20 weddings, you know, like I always want to stay busy in that regard. I like to have 20 weddings is enough that to, keeps you like in, in wedding photography. So I always feel like that's always like a goal, a business goal more than anything. But I feel like I, I not to sound like overconfident or anything, but I feel like I've shot hundreds of weddings and I have a lot of wedding like skills and I don't, I don't, I always know that I could be improving and finding new things. I just don't know what it would be right now. Yeah, it's tricky. I've been trying to lay off of Instagram inspiration, and so it's kind of like you're there with uh, yourself, and then you're just trying to figure out new ways and kind of hitting yourself against, you know, hitting your head against the wall in some ways, and you're just trying to figure out, like, how, what, what can I do to, you know, do this? Because, like, I'm to the point where, you know, I've shot 130 weddings, and I know that I'm not going to screw anything up. And right. so once you get to that point where you, you're confident, you're like, okay, I'm going to get all the shots, then, you know, I, I'm still, like, just kind of, like, like, like in the spot where it's like, how can I, can I push this a little bit further? How can I get like, like the, the shot? Like at first when you're starting out, it's like, how can I even get the shot? And then it's like, right. You're just trying to figure out like what settings I yeah. need to make this look okay. And then over time you're just like trying to figure out how to, how to up yourself, how to make of, that. Yeah, like yeah. How can I do it better than I did last time? Yeah. I still want to make that shot, but I want to make it better. Yeah. And like you just keep doing it. I feel like that's definitely happens and happens and happens till you kind of hit either the peak but I feel like the other thing that's really good, like for, so like if you get ingrained in a specific type of photography for like us, we've been doing wedding photography for a long time. So we've got lots of practice at it and we're already kind of engulfed in it and we know exactly what's coming every time. But if we did something else, like I always find like if I'm like, if I'm working on the YouTube channel or if I'm going out doing some landscape kind of photos for something, or I'm just trying to make something way different than what I would normally make, mm -hmm. that inspires me. And sometimes I'll take that other genre to wedding photography and i'll apply it to my wedding photography and sometimes yeah. i'll just do that without even thinking about it it just kind of yeah kind of yeah, happens i think it's year, good though to try to, to, to oh for sure to i do a lot of different types of photography of, uh, you know? so, like last year so last year i was uh scrolling instagram and there's a lot of of younger uh photographers who are maybe shooting like fashion or doing uh like nighttime photography and stuff and they're incorporating a lot of like neon into their photos and stuff mm -hmm. and like all these different uh court sort of colors at night and i was uh shooting quite a bit of that like i would uh did some like led lights you guys can go check out my rico gr2 video on my other channel um but yeah i did some experimentation like with portraits um, with just adding like pink light and blue light and all this stuff. And then, uh, for, for one of my favorite weddings last year at the university club of Denver, I went there and, um, it was very, very cold outside. So we wanted to keep most of the portraits inside. And we went into this, uh, empty room at like 
you know, like late at night, no, no light whatsoever, no light coming through the windows. And um, I just kind of like got inspired from shooting these other portraits to kind of light it cool. And those were some of my favorite photos last year because Cause you were able to take like that portrait style yeah, yeah, and apply yeah. it to your normal thing. So it was like something cool yeah. you were doing that was new and different, but you applied it to your normal everyday routine, yeah. which made it more fun. Yeah, I think I was doing that stuff because I was bored. And then, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, because at the end of the wedding night, like yeah. you'll have some time sometimes where people are dancing, and you're like, I want to make cool pictures still, but these pictures are all kind of on the dance floor are all the same. Yeah. And I'll always do that myself. Like, I'll kind of pick out some spots in the wedding venue and kind of sneak my, my clients there at the end of the night and be like, hey, can I steal you guys from dancing for 10 minutes and just go make these great, cool night shots that you'll love forever? Yeah. Are there any good photography goals that people should kind of do? I mean, if you're, if you're uh, beginning well, like, in photography, so like when I was starting, about, Like, yeah. when I was starting out, I would set myself some goals like that. Like, some years, uh, like one year, I had a goal where it was nothing, but I was going to work on my composition and I would just read a lot of books about composition. I watched a lot of YouTube videos of artists who like to draw and I would see like how, cause they could conjure up anything with a pencil. Mm -hmm. So I would see how they would go about composition. I would apply that kind of stuff over and over again to my photography and I'd go out and yeah. I'd shoot based off of those things. What, one great uh, artist, just you're talking about drawing a little bit here is uh, Vermeer. So um, go check out Vermeer. I, I think it's, First name was John. I'm, I'm like butchering every name that I'm trying to say today. <laughs> it's it's like weird because uh, we just look at stuff like on our phones or whatever, and we can look up everything. And so it's like I don't actually have to memorize these names. I just have to know a general basis of uh, the spelling or something. But um, but yeah, Vermeer. He has lots of. He was like the first painter to um, to paint like natural light coming through a window and people standing in that light and stuff. Right. And his compositions are really nice. And yeah, kinda, so I feel like that kind yeah. of thing could could be really helpful if you're just starting out. <laughs> Another thing that I did. Uh, one year is I had like each month I would do something different like I, I, I made out a plan ahead of time and I was like yeah. alright in January I'm just going to photograph circles and just triangles mm, and just lines and then just you know what I mean Re -re reoccurring patterns and then I would just spend the month like out and about I would take my photo hikes because I, I, you know when you live down like in the downtown part of a city you can just go walk like for 10 yeah. blocks and find all sorts of circles and reoccurring patterns so, so I would go on a photo walk every morning and I would do that and just to get better I, I like feel like that. that helped me a lot. Yeah. I've done the same thing for colors. I think I had like some yeah. beginner's photography book that like maybe a family member bought for me or something. And it was like 30 photo challenges or something. And I remember driving all over looking for green and like, you know, or just like yeah. whatever color. You just like embark on yeah. crazy things. So yeah, you know, maybe, try to make something. yeah, maybe one New Year's uh, goal if you're a photographer who's kind of in the beginning stages is maybe to go photograph uh, certain colors for a whole day. Maybe like spend a whole week doing like, like all, all different colors or something and only photograph yeah. uh those colors that day because it'll make you uh, see different things and uh, kind of understand the color better and then like uh, yeah, yeah and the, eventually you could end up with like a really cool like collage yeah like, yeah for sure shots. yeah when, when I was like I, I was in my first year of photography and I put all the photos together in like collages and stuff and yeah so and you can just like see them that. together as groupings because it's interesting to look at your pictures yeah. as more than just the one photo but how they could work together in yeah. a series i think when you're starting out in photography you just don't quite have your eye developed and so some of yeah. these like shape or color exercises yeah and just lots of repeating that yeah can, it's can, can just like it can yeah. just like it builds some sort of like we, uh, uh some sort of like connections in your brain 100 percent. if you're starting at 21 let's say and you have spent you, you know, you've spent 21 years of your life going around, not noticing light, not noticing color, just kind of, uh, you know, going autopilot. But then you have to develop your your way way of seeing, being like, oh, there's light there, there's light there, there's a shape there. And so yeah. after you kind of develop that, though, then you don't have to think about it. But Yeah, so it's definitely a good thing to do, to go out and <laughs> shoot shapes or shoot colors. Or another good thing is to go shoot light. Like, if you can go shoot light, Mm -hmm. And you can just figure out like where shadows are, where the highlights are, where the light source is coming from, and, and you can play with it in different ways. You can kind of apply that knowledge to everything. So like I feel like having a lot of those different kinds of exercises and making that part of your, uh, you know, your photography journey for the next year could really progress your art. Yeah. Yeah. I would say if we made some sort of like light uh light tutorial for photographers out there or something that was kind of like kind of be incorporated into resolutions maybe um go photograph nighttime um photograph like hard light photograph yeah try um, to get like that real direction yeah light. golden hour photograph twilight so maybe like and try to get like some shots with crazy shadows where you have like like way difference between the the sh like because i feel like that was something that i learned a lot with when i was shooting black and white like because there's yeah. a while there i would only shoot black and white and i i feel like having that maybe as a resolution could help you really understand the difference between the highlights and the shadows significantly. 
Like, yeah. it, I feel like when I'm shooting black and white, I'm looking for more contrast. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you, you definitely see the, the world a different way, and you're just kind of focusing in on certain things. Um, yeah, and, so there's lots of little yeah. exercises you could put yourself through to, to progress. Like, you don't need yeah. to have a subject and be like, oh, I'm not going to go do this today because I don't have a pretty model, or oh, I'm not going to do that today because I don't right. have the perfect location or whatever. Like, yeah, it's good just to give yourself small goals and just work on it every day. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely get it. Like, I think me and just about every photographer can get into, like, the procrastination phase yeah, where, where you're just like, I don't have, like, the perfect scenery. I don't have the yeah. perfect model. I don't have, like, this and that and that. But if you... Well, I think what I what I realized like the longer I do photography is like half the battle is just stepping out. The yeah, door. it's just showing up and not making yeah. the excuse because it's easy to be like, I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna do this today. I'm gonna do it tomorrow. Yeah. But then what if tomorrow is tomorrow, and then tomorrow is tomorrow, and it just goes on forever, and you never actually do it. So just having like simple goals that you can try to achieve. Yeah. That would make you better. Would get you in the habit of doing it, and then you could add on more complicated tasks as it goes but like i like you're saying like most of it is just showing up like if you get out there and you do it yeah that's what i do um wake up uh like, like right now i'm off season wake up uh do like a little bit of bench press do some uh like <laughs> yeah, just do, do a couple yeah, of yeah, uh, yeah, exercises I mean, the same then, yeah uh then i'm like out the door if i don't have a at-home work day right now so it's just like going outside and shooting for three or four hours some days you might take zero photos which has happened to me a couple of times some days you might take 100 photos you never know yeah so, yeah, I mean, it's good just to get out there and give yourself some some kind of goals and some directions. If you give yourself, yeah. like, some small goals like that, you can really uh, make a big difference yeah. in your photography. Do you have any uh, book recommendations for photographers learning right now? Um, not off the top of my head. It's been a while since I've read, read many beginner photography books. And I have to be honest with you, these days, most of the stuff that we get comes from the Internet. Yeah, it's yeah. YouTube is it's definitely really powerful. Yeah, yeah I would say... Um, how about you? You, I, yeah, you yeah. read a lot of photography books. So uh, so, I sometimes I, tr I try. I'm trying to get through my like massive stack of books that I bought to look smart. So I'm just trying to <laughs> get through all those and donate them. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I would recommend uh, Susan Son uh, Sontag. Uh, she wrote mm -hmm. like a philosophy Sontag, book yeah. on uh, on photography. She was uh, married to Annie Leibovitz. Yeah, they're the partner. Was she? They were oh, partners. I, I don't know. Before I, she died. Yeah. I didn't know that actually. Oh, I think uh, so. I could huh. be wrong. Sometimes I say this stuff yeah, that, and people gonna... are like, in the comments, like, dude, you're totally wrong about that. I'm like, ah, man, yeah, I'm sorry. But, I thought I knew what I was But yeah, I, I don't agree with a lot of it. Like, a lot of it, um, she thinks, like, photography um, is like sexualizing people in a lot of ways and stuff, but I, I don't, I don't see it that way. So I, I, de I definitely disagree, but it's a good basis to kind of get well, maybe like in the, in the past, like in the eighties specifically, like with magazine kind of photos, yeah. like that was really with the bikini models and stuff like that. I could see how she might project that but yeah. like or you go to any instagram influence influence yeah, I mean, like nowadays like you say that. about 500 pixels like that's what brings in the people so like a lot of photographers do that yeah. to get seen to make a name and like it might not be the right way and i could see how some people would see that as yeah yeah negative. and people do it to, uh, today with like instagram i kind of when i was reading that i was like oh yeah like this is kind of like, like instagram you know um right. but and, and stuff like that and then um yeah, but, but it's just an interesting read. And like, like I said, I don't agree with like more than I do agree with, right? But it's, it just like helped me build those opinions a little bit and be like, oh, like, you know, take, take a couple of notes here and there and be like, this is, you know, uh, why I think about it this way. She sees, um, you know, and it, it was made a couple of decades ago. So it's kind of interesting how she goes into um, sort of snapshot culture, maybe like 30 years ago or 40 years ago and how she was kind of talking about how people don't need to have their cameras out on like a vacation to like snap with their brownie camera and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and it's kind of just interesting to apply it to today's world. Um, the Tao of photography is pretty good. The art of photography is pretty good. Um, I think the art of photography, it's like one of the first results on Amazon. I remember reading that a couple of years ago and, and I got quite a bit out of it when I was just learning and very confused, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. think that like, you could definitely learn a lot by reading some books and then yeah. giving yourself challenges. But I feel like you have to get out and do the challenges. Like if oh, you yeah. just read the books and you don't like actually go through the motions and do the photography lessons and like try to get yourself thinking like yeah. that, it's yeah. a lot harder to actually get those skills. Yeah, and uh, to get you thinking about this stuff a little bit more, I, I find that some documentaries do help. You can kind of go overboard and just kind of get into like a brain mush of like photo documentaries. <laughs> Especially not, if like, you have off seasons and you have a long period of time to do so, like you yeah, can do it for weeks. <laughs> yeah, I, I highly recommend uh, Robert Frank's uh, documentary. I can't remember the name of it, but just search like Robert Frank documentary on Amazon. Uh, really, really good. Um, 
Uh, I think it's called uh, Magnum Contacts. Yeah, Magnum Contacts on Amazon Prime is super, super good. It goes through like yeah, 10 so really, cool. really fam uh, famous photographers. Yeah, it's really, a cool series. Yeah, one of yeah, the cool. best uh, photo series I've seen. There's Art 21, I believe it's called. Um, it's through like PBS, but it's also yeah, on Amazon Prime. Amazon. And it goes through other... Uh, other things. Uh, what Remains by Sally Mann is the documentary that got me into photography pretty much. Uh, really, really good. Uh, that is an interesting documentary. Yeah, yeah. Um, For sure. She had done some very interesting work across a bunch of different genres. Yeah. Like she yeah. went from the photographing her kids to like the, uh, there's a part in there where she's like photographs Dead bones bodies. and stuff. Yeah. That was yeah, really it was like an FBI uh, site. Yeah, she was like really into forensics, maybe. Yeah, but the the meaning she has behind the photos all kind of makes sense, and I really respected how she was out there looking for, um, you know, exploring these parts of her life almost like she was dealing with her father's death, and that's why mm -hmm. she was like photographing uh, the bones and like trying to come to terms with it. Mm -hmm. And her dog died, and all this other stuff. That's and, kind of yeah. And then she like photographs her husband who had this who got this weird disease where his uh, you know muscles were kind of going uh, going away and like. You know, so she, all, all these projects kind of had like meaning behind them, and she was like trying to come to terms. But I, I'm kind of a Sally Man stand because I, I read her like 800 page book that is Whoa. written really, really well. Um, I can't remember what that one's called, but if you just uh, search it on, on Amazon, um, she has like an 800, 850 page book that is really, really good. Goes into um, the her, one that's like eight or nine pounds. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but she's she's a uh, she was trying to be a writer before she was a photographer. So and she kind of accidentally kind of fell into photography, yeah. right? It was like her photographing her <clears throat> kids and then it just became popular mm. sort of thing. Uh, well, she she was a, a portrait. She did like portraits of like high school seniors and stuff, and she was like kind of uh, doing like like you know like you know regular small business stuff. But then she had like a sweet giant large format camera, medium format camera, and she yeah. made all these great pictures of her kids with. Yeah, she. Uh, but they were pictures of them like naked, so that kind of like set off. Like, that that's why she got so famous that because set off the because world. you know conservatives. Um, I mean, the, they were her kids, like. Yeah, conservatives in the early nineteen nineteen nineties. Um, really, really didn't like it, and that's why right. she like got onto CNN and all this right. stuff. She had stalkers, she had people. Um, she probably got lots of death threats. And stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, people were so, so mad, because... Um, that, that's like two sides of fame on that one. Yeah, yeah, but it, you know, it's a really amazing story, so look into, into yeah. her. Um, if, if, yeah, just a couple of racks for just uh, cool art art books. Um, Joseph Kol Kolbinka, like all the ones I mentioned earlier, Alex Weber, that's what I'm really into this year, so I'm just looking at all these photos like every other day, being like, I love this, I want to figure out how to make this. So, yeah, so you know, get out yeah. there, apply your resolutions to 2020 and make, make new stuff. Yeah, Try yeah we're going to come back with uh, photo news, so... Um, yeah, let's uh, take a break and then we'll come back and talk about camera gear. Photo footage is currently on break. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you every Sunday for a new photo footage podcast. Now back to photo footage. And I got an email from, I don't know, I don't want to say it was maybe like last week. It was, well, we were off for a week, but it was in between there. I got an email from the CEO of Smug Mug, as oh, did many. That sounds official, man. Wow. <laughs> yeah, as did many of the other users okay. of uh, Flickr. I think everyone. So maybe not that official. Yeah, no, not okay. that official. I think everyone who was a professional were or like, had like yeah, the pro... sounded like you were in like cahoots with them and it was something <laughs> secretive. <laughs> no, I thought you were about to give like give that. the viewers a major story here. No, nothing like that. Well, to to me, it was surprising. <laughs> okay. So, like, what I, what had happened was, uh, I don't know if if everyone's familiar with this, but a few months ago smug mug or maybe it was six eight months ago smug mug pr uh, purchased Flickr, and uh i guess they've been having some troubles with that purchase and so anyway they sent an email out to all of the, the annual renewal users the pro users that pay for the service asking essentially if they knew anyone who'd want to sign up because Flickr, i guess is having financial troubles and they're having a hard time keeping it all going which is sad because i love Flickr. i think Flickr's cool and uh, many other photographers do too. So anyway, it's very interesting that the CEO would publicly ask all of us to like, grassroots in more more photographers, essentially. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to address my use of cahoots. It's a really funny word, and I apologize to the viewers for using. Uh, oh, I thought cahoots. that was like some new social media source <laughs> no, or something. I was like, no, cahoots? It's, it's a joke. Cahoots? No, oh, it's a bad joke. <laughs> but uh... you're not even a dad yet. <laughs> 
All right, but uh, yeah, actually, on to I was just like that was in my head the whole time you were just talking, but I was trying to listen to. Uh, yeah, I got all right, <laughs> but but yeah, like like it seems like like all the photography based social media kind of uh, has the same thing going on. Like they're they're kind of struggling and like they can't get you know have like a big reach like Instagram or even Snapchat, TikTok, all these social media platforms, and so they're trying to compete with them and they can't quite figure out how to make money and it, it just kind of sucks. Like it sounds yeah, to me, it just really appeals to photographers mostly. Yeah. Yeah, and there's not that many photographers, and it's it's sad to see these services um, kind of going, not not going downhill, but just they can't afford um, to keep everything as nice as they would like. It sounds like, and they're kind of right. struggling a little bit, having to ask people to subscribe uh, for you know X amount per year, and you know trying to figure it out, but and trying to get their their member base to <clears throat> to get other people. I mean, that's like a real cry for help, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I mean. I hope uh, Flickr stays stays open and going and stuff, but yeah, I'm at 750 pictures on Flickr right now, and you know I'm approaching 1,000. And I guess once I approach or get to 1,000, then I'm gonna either have to buy the service or um, you know decide to delete a bunch of photos in the backlog. So is that is that what they said? <clears throat> yeah, I, I have the I, I pay for the pro account. I, yeah, when uh, Swungwug <laughs> uh, bought it, they upped the or they. It used to be unlimited uh, photos that you could upload, and it was really cool because it was like you could upload uh, high res to there, and you know on Instagram right, everything right. is the max is 1080 uh, right. pixels, so it was a yeah, cool so way you to could have like your, your yeah pictures and your full res uh, files yeah, there. So cool, yeah. yeah, but hopefully they figure it out and they stay open. I don't know what else to say. But. Yeah. Anyway, so that was uh, one of the the happenings in the news today. Another thing mm. was the. Uh, I saw that the X100V, the next iteration of the uh, Fuji X100 camera, it's not for sure, but the price has been leaked, and they're, they're saying it's going to be uh, $1,499, $1,500, bucks, which is maybe $200 more than I paid for the X100F when it came out, I, I want to say. I want to say it was, I want to say it's just $200 more. So I'm kind of surprised that there's going to be that much of a price hike. I don't know if that's exactly right, or, but my understanding is it's going to be $200 more. Yeah, you were talking about this before we started recording. You were saying that the uh, the old one was actually twelve hundred dollars. So the I think it was twelve ninety nine. So I the recall. F. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. that's so pricey for for that camera because when I shot the Ricoh GR two, I mean those are like five hundred dollars new now, and then the Ricoh GR three is around eight, I think it's eight hundred or eight ninety nine. One of the two, and, and that's a crop like a one point five, one point six. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a crop camera, uh, same focal <laughs> length, and it's a little bit smaller and stuff, and more compact and I'm surprised that people are actually. I didn't realize people were paying so much for the X100F, and um, you know, the yeah, I, that, that camera is really rocking though. There's a bunch of other <laughs> stuff that the X100F does, or the X100 series does that that the Ricoh doesn't. Like it has a leaf shutter, and it has like mm, the the Ricoh shutter is basically silent too. But it's not even so much about that. Is like you can connect it to uh, faster and faster light sources with high speed sync. Are you going to be shooting like headshots in the midday with the X100F? <laughs> <laughs> there's photographers no. that do it dude there are there are photographers that do yeah. wacky stuff with that little camera like i know what you're saying but like it can make a different yeah. look that's unique and uh i've played with it before <laughs> like with some strobes and stuff like because you can get an adapter for it right that that's like a, the telephoto adapter mm -hmm. that basically makes it a 50 f2 and you can do that with the crazy lights yeah. but it, it looks weird still I, I, it wasn't it. for me but like yeah some photographers love that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're going to buy some sort of compact uh, crop sensor 35 millimeter equivalent camera, just buy the Ricoh GR2 or GR3 because the, the uh, lens actually comes in. So my girlfriend has a X100S or something and you can't fit it I mean, in if, maybe if like it was your function was the portability. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the, you know the Ricoh I mean? GR2 or GR3 is You wouldn't want to so put the Fuji X100F. Like mm. it wouldn't fit in your pocket. You wouldn't want to put that in your pocket. Yeah, because you want to hold it collapse. and you want to show it off because it's so cool looking. <laughs> like it's such a sweet looking yeah. little camera. Every time I see it, I just want to hold it. Uh, like I love that little camera. Yeah, I, I mean, I have no clue why anybody would pay double the price for that camera. It seems kind of goofy to me. But I think if you're into the Fuji system, then like maybe. Yeah, yeah. it's a gateway drug, man. Yeah. Like most of us Fuji users now got hooked by that little camera. That little camera sucked us in. Yeah. Because that was the first one I had. I had that with just the regular X100 before they yeah. launched all the, the I mean, as far stuff. as film sims, too, the Ricoh GR2, which I shot for, for about a year, it also has uh, pos this really good positive film sim, which re looks really good in JPEGs, and the black and white uh, simulations are better than the, the uh, Fuji simulations, in my opinion. But Yeah, yeah, better. yeah, I mean, it's all about taste, too. 
and yeah. does the tasting. Anyway, so oh, yeah, it's going to be two hundred dollars uh, more than it used to be, as far as I yeah. Can just tell. go buy a Rico GR3, everybody. But Matthew disagrees, so buy spend more money on it. <laughs> I mean, I would probably yeah. just wait till it comes out yeah. and then see if you can get an X100F on the used market. For a yeah, they do. That's, yeah, that's what I would do. But they seem to be pretty fairly priced in the used market. I mean, if you well, got a bunch so. of money and you want to have the newest thing that has the latest sensor and the cool specs and stuff i mean maybe you'd buy the new one i, I just yeah. i'm surprised that they raised the price so much yeah yeah that yeah. seems like a lot for a fixed lens camera but maybe it'll have some features we don't we don't know about or something but yeah i don't know all I'm right so um yeah let's just talk about since we have sort of a short news week let's talk about a couple of interesting cameras um of 2019 so this last year so i think that the iphone pro was actually a really interesting camera what do you I mean, you obviously agree the iPhone. Well, 11. I have the iPhone 11. Yeah. I don't have the Pro version. I, yeah. Mine just has the two cameras. It has yeah, the same uh, wide cameras, angle though, the without the telephoto. Yeah, it just doesn't have the telephoto. Yeah. But otherwise, it's the same. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I like to me. That's one of my favorite cameras, the iPhone camera. Like it's always yeah. in my pocket. I use it all the time. I use the video functions to record my my kiddo all the time. Like I use it to 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 capture life so in a way it's like a, it's like a recording device like for so i can remember things but at the same time like it's one of the most used cameras that i have i don't use it as much for artistic purposes though it's more for yeah. document yeah i think it's it's really interesting that this camera on the iphone uh, 11 and 11 pro is so so good like you've never had a camera this good and as many options in uh in any other cell phone before and yeah. the colors are amazing in the iphone 11 pro and uh it looks, iPhone 11. Yeah, it looks nice yeah and i'm surprised because like when i first got it i thought like when you would swap between cameras you would notice and sometimes you do like you'll you'll notice it kind of jitter between two but it's pretty fluid overall and yeah. also i didn't realize that i wanted that wide of an angle on that kind of like on my phone. I didn't realize I wanted it until I had it. And yeah. then now that I have it, I find myself using the wide angle camera a lot, nice. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I, I mean, I will say about that, that wide angle camera, I wish it was, uh, F 2.0 instead of, uh, yeah, F 2.4. There's a 2.8. 2.8, 2.4. It's not F 2 though. No. Yeah. I think it's yeah, 2.8. So I think that they're saving that for this next year. They'll probably, um, you know, open up the aperture a little bit. If, if I, think I had it's to twenty six millimeter. But it's still, like... yeah, it's still really cool that you can get that perspective. And for like, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, and it really opens up a new form of photography for people who have been shooting on iPhones forever. Right. So they've never got that that wider angle. They've never uh, been able to see that. And you don't even have to move. You just press it on the screen, and they're like, oh, this is how like this looks wide. And so maybe it'll get more people into using wide angles or. You know, yeah. just um, a new thing. But yeah, people kind of became more savvy to telephoto photography and bokeh and stuff when the iPhone uh, X came out or iPhone uh, Plus series, and uh, they were able to add the bokeh. Yeah, effect. that's kind of interesting because like yeah. you wouldn't, you you kind of think like this kind of photography being so computerized in a yeah. in a can in a phone and being ha had by so many people would like in a way cheapen photography and make it less accessible. But if they kind of are interested in that look and that aesthetic, then it makes our jobs more important yeah. to them. Like and it it's makes a, us more, more prevalent. Yeah. Nowadays, if you're starting out or you just uh, are posting to Instagram, basically, so if you're not posting uh, big high-res photos or hoping to get them um, right. printed or anything, yeah. then, man, why not? Why not just buy an iPhone Pro, edit it in Lightroom Mobile, and freaking blog? And you, you have do, three. You can make a website. You on have your three phone lenses now. all the time. Yeah. Like, you you could literally have just one, one device, and you could shoot over and over again, and you know you could make amazing results with, uh, with those cameras. I I mean, I've been through phases where I've shot um, tons and tons of cell phone photos, and you know I love the Mastin Mastin Labs app too. Mm -hmm. That was a really great uh, app for editing and stuff, yeah. and you can really make great results. And if you really want to kind of dial it in, and you know if you want to shoot raw, you can shoot raw on Lightroom Mobile, and then yeah. um, do all that. But then the iPhone also has a bunch of computational photography features that if you shoot right, so the that's app, some stuff that you could do that's outside <clears throat> of the realm of like a yeah. pro camera. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the iPhone iPhone series right now is actually doing more than a lot of pro cameras as far yeah. as like not blowing highlights and stuff. Well, like, they have a lot more yeah. computer power in them. You know what I mean? Like the yeah. processors and iPhones are yeah. way faster I, than I are these going videos. cameras. Yeah, I've watched these videos of uh, this guy shooting a Canon 5D4 uh, next to an iPhone 11 Pro, and he's like shooting it, and 
the sky is completely blown out. You can't even see anything. And then you take the iPhone um, 11 Pro and then he actually gets a better result for Instagram. Like you can't really tell on Instagram how much resolution is there or whatever. Mm-hmm, right. Just by shooting one one frame with, with that. I mean, you could do an HDR blend. You could... Uh, underexposed bring up the shadows um, on that but it's a lot of extra work and so if you're beginning then it's almost like a better option just to shoot on your phone have this one awesome all-in-one device where you can blog uh, share your photos on instagram and edit and all that stuff people can even edit 4k and you can learn the three different perspectives so like you could like maybe you don't know exactly what millimeters they are and you don't care you're just like i either shoot wide i shoot Mm -hmm. normal or i shoot telephoto and if you got really good at at that inside of your camera you could then apply that to a, a pro camera system them later and just totally understand it you know what i mean like it would just translate well so i feel like the iphone 11 was definitely one of the best cameras of 2019 for sure yeah i love the focus on the cameras and uh yeah, I think it just makes a lot of a lot of sense for Apple to do that right yeah. now. There wasn't too image many... stabilization in it too. It's just phenomenal. Like on the video, oh yeah, like I can yeah. run around with my kid and it doesn't look like the Blair Witch Project. You know, it's great. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> this is really helpful. You know. Yeah, but but yeah, the, I mean. If you're starting out in photography, you should definitely uh, go go buy the um, the iPhone 11 Pro yeah, yeah. or iPhone 11. Or even the 11. If yeah, you're just if you're not if you're not into that kind of contrived headshot look, I think like I, I've noticed a lot of like Instagram influencers, right? They're uh, shooting more on like the the wider lenses in the iPhone, and they're uh, not shooting like more like like headshotty type stuff with bokeh. Yeah, more like, about the scene yeah, and like trying to make yeah. cool compositions. Yeah, if you're just shooting for for Instagram and you want some, you don't want anything like kind of that looks overproduced man it's just it's great you know you don't have to go buy you know a 35 millimeter and and um a camera you know so yeah exactly yeah so anyway yeah. that's one of my yeah. favorite cameras of 2019 so, for sure yeah back on to slow news week here um i thought we could talk about the best used cameras to buy in 2020 and used cameras yeah. yep yep best uh used cameras so these cameras might be priced well they might be um you know just uh you know, but so, so our own perspective, like what's your favorite and what's my favorite? Yeah, camera? yeah. Okay. Used cameras. If, uh, if I was going to recommend one camera, yeah, or of 2020, sorry. So uh, in 2020, but yeah. it'd be a camera from the past. <laughs> but now there's yeah, 2020. I'm not doing great at talking today, but okay, I got yeah, you. Yeah, so uh, best used cameras of 2020. Let's go. Um, go. Yeah, just maybe start Probably off. Probably the XE3. I think mm-hmm. you can get the uh, Fuji X. E3 without a lens. I think you can pick up one of those on the used market for maybe 400 bucks now. Mm. You could buy a Canon 5D Classic for that much money, though, and it's full frame. <laughs> Why wouldn't you just buy a full frame camera? <laughs> well, I'm, that's the great debate with amongst Fuji users. Yeah. So, like, well, I'll give you one reason mm-hmm. because that full frame camera only has 12 megapixels. That, the that's XT3 true. has that's true. 24 but megapixels. But you can, you can print like an 11 by 14. You can print a 20 by 30. Even I've heard photographers claim that online with 12 megapixels. So, I mean, why do you need more <laughs> megapixels? I prefer <laughs> to have... Would you rather have like the look though? The look no, of full no, frame? No, no. I don't... No. I, you know, like that was the funny thing is like when I went from Canon shooting to mm-hmm. shooting the Fuji system, I didn't miss it at all. And in fact, I feel like when I was shooting full frame, I was relying on Boca way more than I do now. I have mm-hmm. to try a lot harder, and I can't like just phone in some shots that I used to just be like, oh, I'm just gonna bokeh that out. Yeah. I ha- it's like so to me, like I feel like having a camera that's ten years newer. Like the when did that co- camera come out? The the five D classic in two thousand three, two thousand four. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, that thing is 10 years older than the XC3. Yeah, but, the but what's, amazing about, systems, it, what, like what's the, amazing about it is the CCD sensor and the colors you get out of it. I still miss the colors from that 5D Classic. It's so so cool. is that your recommendation for people? They go get the if 5D have, Classic in and Yeah, if you have uh, 300 bucks, like I was looking on eBay and I saw something well, for 300 so the XC3 would probably be 400 bucks. It would be a little mm, bit more. Yeah, but if you maybe have... Um, you know, you can buy that and like a nifty 50 and you can get like such a good result at golden hour. I think and yeah, like the colors like kind of are a so classic. Good. You look like it's going to look like more like nineties-y than the yeah. Fuji. Like the Fuji is going to give you more dynamic range. It's going to give you a sensor that's more, more. <laughs> I now. guarantee you in uh, 10 years, hipsters are going to be shooting the 5d classic for the CCD <laughs> colors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. My You're recommendation right. to the audience is just yeah. to get an early start because get your get, hipster just on and just get start, that camera yeah. now. Yeah, it's all be, about the CCD look. <laughs> you'll be four or five years ahead of the, ahead of the game. <laughs> yeah, man. CMOS <laughs> is so, is, is so like uh, grainy. Once that camera is so 20 years old, uh, it'll be classic <laughs> enough that yeah. hipsters want it. 
Yeah. That's interesting. But, yeah, I don't I don't agree with you at all. I would not shoot that Canon camera over the Fuji. No way. And the Fuji camera is uh, in 2020 for 400 bucks. That's uh, to me. That's just a steal of a deal. Like I don't I don't know many cameras that that could outperform that for 400 dollars. Aren't the lenses going to be so much more expensive? Yeah, though? you're going to spend money on the lenses. Yeah, yeah, like this Canon. But you has could this, get like the cheaper yeah. lenses, like so they have the Cron series, like that's like the underneath their Pro series that are f two yeah. lenses. How much is a, really how much nice. is a use thirty five millimeter equivalent for for like a Cron one? Do you know like the approximate cost for a thirty five millimeter? Yeah. So like if you were to get a thirty five millimeter f two equivalent on mm -hmm. that, um, I think that that's the twenty. They have a twenty three. I think it's a twenty three f two. That's like. I'm gonna say it's three ninety nine, brand new. Probably get it used for about three hundred bucks. Mm, okay. So that whole system maybe would cost you six or seven hundred bucks, but man, yeah, you I could get some good yeah, results for that. Yeah, they're equivalent in price. Um, honestly, I think it was kind of it was fun to debate a little bit, but I think either you can't really go wrong with either for like three hundred bucks if you're it's just getting gonna a make good pictures either way. Yeah, I mean, you just the thing is is with yeah. the DSLR, you're gonna have the DSLR, so you're gonna have to frame up the picture. You're gonna have to think about it. With the XC3, you're gonna get a mirrorless camera. You're gonna be able to see mm. the picture. You're gonna have all those tools of now that you're not gonna have with the DSLR. Yeah, yeah, but I think either of these cameras would be better than buying like in. Like going to Costco and, and getting like the, a Rebel, yeah, like a like Rebel the with lens. the kit lens or whatever <laughs> yeah. they sell now, or an A six thousand. Yeah, don't do that. Like unless you're yeah. desperate and you just don't yeah, know yeah. If you have three hundred bucks, I would. Uh, these are two great recommendations for uh, for twenty twenty used cameras. Um, yeah, especially if you're yeah. trying to make like artsy kind of photography and you're trying yeah. to create something that's really beautiful to you. Yeah, yeah. I've had bad experiences buying used cameras from just about everywhere because I bought so many cameras and it was just inevitable. But yeah, um, some are better than others. But yeah, camera shops. Um, yeah, usually if you get from like KEA, yeah, or, uh, uh, eBay. BNA. Yeah, eBay. If you have, um, if there's a good return policy and it's a legitimate seller, I've only had problems when I bought from uh, one person or sold to one person who wasn't like a legitimate seller who seemed like they were trying to kind of game the system. But as long as you, you can buy from like Adorama on Adorama on eBay. and BNH yeah. and KEH. All those ones are really good big. Yeah, companies. yeah, KH. So I, I've maybe KH costs that. a little more, but like sometimes I've had more peace of mind, especially with the camera. Generally, yeah. lenses are fine. Yeah, um, but yeah, eBay is gonna be the cheapest, but you're kind of gambling there a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sometimes I've, you could get yeah, burned. Yeah, yeah. For, for example, I sold um, an an A seven R three on there, and then um, I sent it off, and it was it was stupid on my part, just because I I'd had so many experiences selling things on eBay, and I didn't like take it too seriously. I've sold like like lots of stuff, and um, sent it out, and the guy claimed that he never got it, and I didn't actually like the tracking said that it arrived and stuff, but I didn't do signature confirmation, and so um, uh, PayPal and eBay sided with him, and so I was out. Uh, like 2500 bucks or something yeah so sometimes like i've gotten burned not yeah quite that bad but i've gotten burned on ebay for a lot of money before and i, yeah. I like so you just got to be careful and yeah, know that sure. like you could end up with yeah you could, so be, you could be you in get my situation like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but if you, you go with a company star for how much money i lost on ebay <laughs> right but if you go with a company like b and h or adorama or yeah. even keh they're gonna have a reputation they're gonna want to keep and they're gonna fix it you know yeah yeah for sure but ebay is always um Interesting because you can always find like yeah, the cheapest prices on there. there. But yeah, there's also all sorts of things like you can yeah. get like I'd say buy, buying on there is actually safer than selling in a way. Yeah, like, there's more production yeah, I feel and stuff. Like that's but, true too. But yeah, I mean anyway. Uh, speaking of eBay, I was recently looking at uh, Pentax six four five Z's out of curiosity, and I saw some for twenty eight hundred, uh, twenty nine hundred. Maybe a little bit less. It's a beast um, of a camera. Huh? Three, yeah, three thousand dollars with the fifty-five. I saw a couple That's of about those. about as cheap as digital medium formats get. Huh? Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, basically that scaled-up A7R sensor that has that amazing dynamic range. I mean, mm -hmm. the dynamic range is equal to um, you know the Sony A7. Well, it's the same sensor that's in the that's in the Fuji, right? The GFX. Yeah, yeah, the, the GFX sensor. Hasselblad. Uh, Hasselblad, X1D. right? Yeah, so that's yeah. like that's a sweet sensor. Yeah, I guess like why I'd go for this this one is because obviously it's cheaper and like, but I do. Really really love the grip and the is the, the lenses good for it though yeah yeah what kind of lenses did you have i had the the 55 millimeter the 55 millimeter is is really really cheap actually mm -hmm. and um it comes with the camera what a lot speed of the time. is it what is that uh 2.8 oh. yeah yeah 2.8 on a yeah. medium format system is a lot faster yeah, than people realize yeah, yeah yeah definitely and like uh it, it resolves a lot the bokeh um it's pretty good too and like you can make some really good bokeh on that if you get in close and 
the thing I loved about that lens is that it was um, basically a 43 millimeter um, full frame equivalent. And so, but you were shooting at 55, so it was like a little bit more compressed. So you got more like, bokeh, but you could get more scene. Yeah, yeah, totally. Really great lens. Yeah. I mean, then I is the, that the only one you had? No, no, I had the, the 90 millimeter macro. That one was a, that one is pricey, man. It was about $2,800 to even use. So is that like a it was like $5,000 $5, $5, new. Um, yeah, it was like a 75, and it has 75? macro capability, and it was by far the sharpest and most like modern. It was $5,000? Yeah, Whoa. yeah. Yeah, and it's by far the sharpest. So that's like twice the cost of the body now. Uh, yeah. Well, well, yeah. well. You just you can probably find them for about. 3, I mean, 000. wouldn't you rather just like an adapt an Otis on there for that? Mm, well, you can't because of the flange distance. Oh, it's too far. Yeah, mm. but I think that they have really great native lenses, <laughs> and the files are really really flat. Um, the ISO performance is really really great. Like for some reason, the sensor, how they did the everything with the sensor, like the the colors. And stuff um, stay really neutral, and the ISO performance up to really, really high looks great, and it feels great in the hand. Lots of phys physical dials, but I just thought this was an interesting one since it that's is an so expensive cheap. camera, though. To say is a 2020 pick for used camera because <laughs> 2800 is still a pricey uh, intro kit. Yeah, without a lens. Oh yeah, the, but, this is I mean so medium many, format. Yeah. so like that's yeah. I think you know, in the there's so much going on in full frame, and so it's kind of. It's like interesting to think about like like either having the most compact camera like a Ricoh GR2 or just like going all out and getting like a medium format camera. I mean, me, I'm working. I'm a working photographer, and right. I'm not in like gear mode. I, yeah, I just that's like why don't it didn't make so as much, much sense when you're when you're shooting a lot yeah. of weddings to have that much camera. But now, now the medium format cameras are getting so cheap. Um, right. I, I think it's it's interesting. It's getting more plausible, especially yeah. uh, since uh, Fuji came out with that rangefinder version of the GFX, mm -hmm. the, the smaller. 50R, that camera started off a lot cheaper. So, like, in a couple of years mm. from now, we're going to be talking about how inexpensive that particular yeah, camera is. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely, definitely interesting. Especially but... since they're working on the 100. So, like, once the 100R comes out, that's yeah. going to become a very affordable medium format camera, too. So, yeah, medium format, I bet in five years from now, medium format, used medium format cameras are going to be very readily available to all professional photographers. Yeah, yeah, keep on, um, you know, I hope those prices keep on coming down and yeah, I think even the, uh, just to rant a little bit more here, so I'm like talking your ear off about pen taxes, uh, but the the 6 for 5 d it has a CCD sensor, and if you don't need the ISO or dynamic range, that's also a really great medium format camera. If it's like into. a good light, if you're in a good light kind of photographer, like yeah, you're or shooting studio. in the yeah, studio. Or like you can lighting. get those for less than like an a7 III, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah like like... But it has the CCD sensor, so the yeah. colors are a little bit different. Yeah, it's kind of, and it's not like so cheap that you'd want to really invest into it if um, if you. Does Pentax still support it though? Like, would they still help you with it if it broke? Uh, I, I have no clue what's going on with Pentax. It seems like they're halfway yeah. dead and they're not. But then the the Rico line is like kind of part of Pe Pentax too, right? And then well, I heard that they had like a crop sensor DSLR they were trying to roll out or something. Did oh, they put they... it on pause or something? I'm not sure what's going on with Pentax, but it doesn't yeah. seem like they're. Uh, they're, they're they're killing it right now. Yeah, the only thing I know about Pentax is they have made uh, three really amazing cameras: six four five Z, Ricoh GR two. I cannot mention how much I fucking I love the Ricoh GR two. Uh, I've heard the Ricoh GR three is great too. So just like these three cameras, great color science, great ISO, great dynamic range, and uh, one is really really compact. Put it in your pocket and uh, just keep it in your pocket all day and not even like nothing compact about, about that uh, six four five. No, but, but yeah, <laughs> it's, it's either yeah, it's either go go all the way compact, shoot on your Rico GR two, or just go go full on uh, medium format and carry on this big thing. And one nice thing about the six four five Z six four five Z is that it feels like a hefty piece of gear. It feels kind of special when you're holding it, which. I, I don't know, just the the big uh, like grip in there and stuff. It feels like a like a I don't know. It has a nice feeling too. Like but. you got to use this thing up to its potential. You can't just like yeah. spray and pray with it. You gotta you gotta work with it. Yeah, for sure. I know what she's talking about. But yeah. Anyway, so yeah, any other, great um, cameras for twenty twenty if you're looking in the used market. Yeah. If you're gonna shoot film, I would always recommend probably you look at M six every year. <laughs> How much are those? Man, uh, it's pricey. Like I, the last one I had was in maybe 2016, and I sold it off for maybe 1,500 bucks. Mm, yeah, that is pricey for a film camera. So my guess is they've gone yeah. up since then. Uh, those are appealing to me because they're they're basically all mechanical, right? Like they're sweet cameras. Too, yeah, yeah, like yeah, I think it's cool just to. It's like owning like an old car or something if you're a photographer. Yeah. You just kind of get that vintage feel. You don't think yeah, about it, it too cool much. Yeah, makes cool pictures. And, and like the yeah. way that the 
like the the way the rangefinder works on it is is like old school. Like so, you have mm-hmm. to line everything up and it has to be right, and it just feels like a throwback. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of like it's like a camera that's not really going to go out of style. So like, no, you can shoot yeah, that thing forever. You know, uh, film is already outdated, so right. it's never going to be outdated again. I mean, right? Like yeah. it's still around <laughs> yeah. somehow. We're still shooting film. Yeah, people still so. look at the film pictures and stuff um, yeah, from totally. thirty years ago. So yeah. you, it's nice knowing that you're shooting on an already outdated format, and you don't have to think about the gear. That's what yeah, that's the nice part yeah. about having an older system. Yeah, it's like, then, <laughs> I'm yeah. not going to get the new thing because yeah. there's no new thing. I always hear like <laughs> car people talk about how. Uh, how like power steering kind of ruins the experience compared to like an old like right, right, Porsche right. or something. And yeah, so, and if you used to yeah. shoot that kind of camera all the time and you're just kind of used to that old school film camera, that's what you want for sure. Yeah. Anyway, 2020. Yeah. Brand new year. Brand yeah, new buy, year. A, buy an M6, Thanks, buy a 645Z, buy a Ricoh GR2, uh, buy a Fuji, you know, buy, just buy all the cameras. Yeah, get a bunch of cameras <laughs> and fulfill your 2020 uh, yeah, and then, goals uh, with them. Yeah, buy all of them and then realize that you don't actually uh need all this camera gear and then like sell it off maybe next year and then maybe just shoot one camera and try to become a good photographer that's, that's my advice yeah 